So now I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker is Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. She's the founder and chief executive officer for the Center for Youth Wellness. She's earned international attention for her innovative approach to addressing adverse childhood experiences as a risk factor for health problems. Dr. Burke Harris serves as an expert advisor on Hillary Clinton's Too Small to Fail initiative and the Clinton Foundation in association with Next Generation. This initiative aims to help parents and businesses take meaningful actions to improve the health and well-being of children ages zero to five so that more of America's children are prepared to succeed in the 21st century. Dr. Burke Harris also serves as an advisor on Governor Jerry Brown's Let's Get Healthy California Task Force and as a committee member for the American Academy of Pediatrics Medical Home for Children Exposed to Violence Committee. Her work has been profiled in Paul Tuff's best-selling book, How Children Succeed, Grit, Curiosity, and the Hidden Power of Character, which was hailed by the New York Times columnist David Brooks as essential. Dr. Burke Harris's work has also earned her the American Academy of Pediatrics Arnold P. Gold Foundation Humanism and Medicine Award in 2013. And with that, I welcome Nadine Burke Harris. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start by saying congratulations to Dr. Dowd. Um, it could not be more well deserved. And um, as usual, we start with the disclaimer slide. I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose, but I do have something to disclose. You guys, I am fired up. Earlier this week, I had an opportunity to speak at a very special event called Google Zeitgeist. Google.org is one of the big supporters of the Center for Youth Wellness. And at this meeting, I had an amazing opportunity to meet with a bunch of folks who are changing the world. And the highlight for me was meeting a gentleman by the name of Kailash Satyarthi. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014. He shared it with Mulala Youssef for his work in rescuing 85,000 children from child slavery in India. And can I just tell you, the experience of hearing his words and shaking his hand has got me inspired. I am inspired to do everything within my power to improve outcomes for others. And the great news is, we don't have to risk our lives as Dr. Satyarthi did, but we can be on the front lines of addressing this national and truly global public health crisis by simply doing what we do every day. I wanna start by just seeing a show of hands. How many, for, folks are familiar with the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. All right, that's wonderful, most of the room. And of course, the, the science of toxic stress, again, most of us. Now I'm gonna ask a different question. How many of us are using this in some concrete way in our practice? Okay, that's wonderful, and I want it to be more. So I, I'm going to start by just going over the basics, reviewing and refreshing to get us all on the same page. Most of this I know that you already know. But um, we know that the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study that was published by Vince Felitti and Dr. Bob Anda in 1998 um, asked about these 10 different types of adverse childhood experiences. And those include physical, emotional, and sexual abuse physical and emotional neglect, growing up in a household where there was parental mental illness, incarceration, substance use, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence, right? And the way that they use this information was for every category that someone endorsed, they would get a point on their ACE score. And then Felidian and Anda compared ACE scores against health outcomes. 
And what they found was absolutely striking, right? For this population that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated, what they found was that two thirds, 67% had at least one ace, and one in eight, 12.6%, had four or more aces. The other thing that they found was that there was a dose response relationship between ACEs and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. And as we can see, I've listed here the 10 leading causes of death in the United States of America. And for a person who has an ACE score of four or more, they have a relative risk of ischemic heart disease. Oh man, I forgot to change this number on the slide. Dang it, okay. So they had a relative risk of ischemic heart disease that was 220%, uh, which is um, more than double that of someone who had zero ACEs. For COPD, I have 260%, but it's actually 390%. That 260 is from a different data set, I apologize. Um, but we can see, what we can see here is the profound impact, not only on the health and well-being of Americans, but also on our healthcare system and our economy. Right? If you have four or more ACEs, you have significantly greater risk of seven out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States. And I would venture to say, accidents is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. And I would venture to say um, that there is data that shows that if you have four or more ACEs, it dramatically increases your risk for accidents as well. Uh, but that was from a different data set. So we can see eight out of 10 of the leading causes of death are dramatically impacted by history of ACEs. Now, of course, initially Felidi and Onda attributed this increased risk to increased risk of health damaging behaviors such as smoking. And we know that if you have four or more ACEs, you are much more likely to smoke than someone with an ACE score of zero. Similarly, a person with four or more ACEs has 7.4 times the risk of being an alcoholic as an adult as a person with zero ACEs. And we're likely to see early intercourse, so more than three times the risk of uh, early intercourse, double the risk of teen pregnancy, and double the risk of teen paternity among those who have an ACE score of four or more as compared to those who have an ACE score of zero. And I'm gonna pause here and take a quick second to observe that when we look at teen pregnancy, 42% of women who participated in the ACE study, if, of those who had four or more ACEs, 42% of them got pregnant as a teenager. That's almost half. That is a huge number. And in our own data um, at the Center for Youth Wellness, when we looked at patients at our Bayview Child Health Center, what we found was that our patients uh, who had an A score or four or more were twice as likely to be overweight or obese and were 32.6 times as likely to have learning or behavior problems in school as those with an A score of zero. As you see here, for our children, our black and brown children growing up in Bayview Hunters Point, where the mean household income is uh, $28,000 a year, but in Hunters Point it's actually $14,000 a year, if they had no ACEs, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. Again, we saw the dose response relationship, and at an ACE score of four or more, more than half of our kids had learning and behavior problems. Now, different from Felidi and Anda's research, of course, we were dealing with a population here where the mean age was eight. So they have a lot more living to do. And we see um, across the United States, there are now 28 states that collect ACE data as part of their behavioral risk factor surveillance uh, system. I'm very proud to say that California was the first state uh, to collect this information. But what we see among the states that are reporting this information, and not all of these, these states uh, do report publicly this information, that all of them have at least 50% of the population 
with at least one adverse childhood experience. And, and, and those uh, which data we could get a hold of have between 13 and 17 percent of the population with an ACE score of four or more. So I hope that um, I've convinced you that this, this is an important issue. This is a public health crisis. When we look at the demographic data, looking at race and ethnicity, in California, to our surprise, we found, looking at four years worth of data in California, that the prevalence across race and, race and ethnicity, ethnicity was actually quite similar. Uh, the Hispanic or Latino population had the greatest prevalence of those with ACEs, uh, four or more ACEs, with 17.3%. Um, uh, but of course, we certainly know that this doesn't reflect other risk factors for toxic stress, right? It doesn't reflect, uh, this only refers to the traditional 10 Felidian uh, ONDA criteria. It doesn't reflect community violence. It doesn't reflect uh, discrimination, et cetera. But this is really important to recognize that there is no community in which we don't need to be looking for ACEs as a risk factor for toxic, toxic stress. This really impacts us all. So what are the solutions, right? That is where I am passionately focused. And in order to get to solutions, I believe that we have to look at the biology of adversity to understand where are the targets for intervention. So you're walking in the forest and you see my friend here, right? And let's think about what happens to us biologically. We have activation of our HPA axis. Our hypothalamus sends a signal to our pituitary, which sends a signal to our adrenal gland that says, you know, release stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. And so we, you know, our heart starts pounding. We have increased cardiac output. Our airways open up, our pupils dilate, and we are ready to either run from that bear or fight that bear. And that's fantastic if, you're, uh, if you see a bear and you're in the forest. But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system that was designed to be once every once in a, a long time, adaptive or life-saving system is activated over and over and over again. It's activated when my patients get off the bus and they see the flowers where a child before them was gunned down. It's activated when they meet the bully uh, on the playground. It's activated when Pops comes home and he's had a few too many drinks. And this system goes from being adaptive to maladaptive or health damaging. And this is what we know is now called toxic stress. We know from our colleagues that not all stress is bad. In fact, I needed a little bit of positive stress this morning when my alarm went off at 7 a.m., which is 4 a.m. California time, and I had to drag my behind out of bed. Um, that that uh, those brief increases in heart rate and blood pressure and mild elevation in hormonal levels are actually a normal and essential part of healthy development. We know that tolerable stress is having the body's alert systems raised to a higher degree, but this activation is time limited and is buffered by the presence of a caring adult. And that could include examples of uh, Tolerable stress could include death of a loved one, divorce, natural disaster. But we all know the divorce that could have been tolerable stress, but ended up being toxic stress, right? <laughs> We've all been privy to that situation. I had a family that I cared for that had such an acrimonious divorce, including discharge of firearms, etc that the handoff of the kids, they ultimately decided need to happen, needed to happen every week at the police precinct. This is not a joke, this is a real story, right? 
And what did we see? We actually saw symptoms of toxic stress in those patients. We saw developmental regression. We saw poor impulse control. We actually saw two of the children uh, began having aneurysis and uh, severe uh, school impairment, right? And so with toxic stress, what we see with that strong, frequent, or prolonged adversity is disruption of brain architecture and other organ systems, increased risk of stress-related disease and cognitive impairment, right? But we also know that a stressor, any individual stressor, does not have to go to this toxic stress level. Our hope is that with er early identification and effective intervention, including social emotional buffering, parental resilience, early detection, that we can move those and keep them in the category of a tolerable stress from which our patients can heal. We recognize that the multi-systemic impacts of toxic stress affect all organ systems, including HPA axis dysregulation, VTA and reward center dysregulation. And can I just talk for a second about the VTA, the ventral tegmental area of the nucleus accumbens? We know this is the pleasure and reward center of the brain. And I want to go back to Felidi and Anda's thought about increase of high, um, increased high risk behavior actually being the thing that leads to increased um, risk of disease. And if there's one thing that I want to point out, when a child grows up in a household from infancy and ex exposed to high doses of adversity, one of the things that we know is that there is alterations in the ventral tegmental area of the nucleus accumbens. There are changes in the dopamine receptors in that part of the brain that actually predispose to high-risk behavior. So we want to recognize that it's not just that these folks grow up in uh, rough environments and so th they drink and smoke and do all these things because they see it around them, but they are neurologically primed because of changes in their VTA to be more susceptible to uh, substance dependence and to engaging in high-risk behavior. We see toxicity in the hippocampus and we see changes in neurotransmitter and receptor uh, dysregulation. But the, the thing that really drives me crazy, the thing that really upsets me, is the fact that we've seen the data that shows that when you do the logistic regression analysis and you remove all of the effect of health damaging behavior, that only attenuates about 50% of the risk. Now that, that hardly seems fair, right? You know, we all hear the stories, this, the Horatio Alger stories about the folks who have a rough background, but they pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and then they go on and, and they get their education, and they get married, and then they have their own kids, and then bam, they get COPD. They get, they get uh, heart disease. They get cancer, right? It turns out that the, the immunologic effect the chronic, the fight or fight effect, one of the important pieces of toxic stress is that it's not just engagement of the neurologic stress response, but it's also engagement of the immune system. And what we see is dysregulation of the immune system, increased inflammatory mediators, increased markers of inflammation like interleukins, TNF alpha, and interferon gamma. We see an altered microbiome, right? And this is a very important part of the reason why folks, even if they don't engage in high-risk behavior, are still at greater risk for some of the leading killers in our nation. We know on, from a hormonal standpoint, we see long-term changes in things like cortisol, adrenaline, and other hormones. And the root of the root is the impact on our DNA the differential gene expression. And that's what leads to the pro-inflammatory transcription factors. That's what leads to changes in neurotransmitter receptors because high doses of adversity change the way our DNA is read and transcribed. It changes the way our, our brain responds to subsequent stressors, 
right? And it affects our telomere length. It leads to telomere shortening, which increases wear and tear on our DNA and ultimately cellular aging. And finally, we also see things in our circulatory system. Increased plasma endothelin-1, increased total peripheral resistance, diastolic blood pressure, and pulse, pulse, pulse wave velocity. So what the heck are we going to do about it? Every single one of us in this room is on the front lines. I will tell you, at my center, the Center for Youth Wellness, our number one mission is to figure out how we take all those research studies, right, which your average public does, has no access to, and change it into practice. All of the science in the world about toxic stress doesn't do anybody a lick of good unless we in this room do our jobs differently. We need an ecological model for addressing ACEs and toxic stress. And that includes primary prevention, raising national awareness, or as I would call it, shout it from the rooftops, y'all. It includes secondary prevention, which means routine screening. The only way we're gonna get to early detection and intervention is by if, if we do routine screening. We know that it works for lead, we know that when we ask about tobacco, we know that it works for cancer, right? You do routine screening, and what does that allow us to do? It allows us to detect earlier, and that means our intervention can be less intensive, less expensive, and that it's more likely to be successful than when we catch things way down the line. If we're waiting for that kid to get booted out of school, right? before they're referred to someone who ultimately gets to the bottom of the bottom to ask the right questions to say, oh my gosh, what's happening to you? The biologic systems, right? The, the changes to brain architecture already so established that they're much more difficult to treat than if we screen on a routine basis. And oh, by the way, asking every parent and educating every parent goes back to, number one, the primary prevention. Because folks know what to look for and they know when to bring their kids in. Tertiary prevention, what does that look like? Well, it includes current best practices, including home visiting, mental health, social work, and two generation interventions. We, I, I hear all the time from folks, hey, you know what, Nadine, we really believe you on this ACEs and toxic stress stuff, but, you know, is that really ready for prime time? How can we do this? In fact, how can we screen if we don't have a validated screening tool? I'm going to tell you I agree, I agree with those concerns. It's true that we don't have a validated screening tool. But I will tell you one thing. Even Felidian Anda's screening tool at this point is still not validated, right? But what we do know is that there are millions of children across our nation who are right now receiving no intervention. And I believe the harm of not screening is greater than, the har that, than any harm of screening. I believe we have to be educated about it. I believe we have to be thoughtful about it. But I believe there is a case for a compassionate use protocol here so that we can begin to do some thoughtful prevention and intervention. And finally, I also agree with these questions around, well, you know, what are we supposed to do? We need more research. We need more uh, translation of, you know, what's happening in these, uh, in these mouse studies and the, the bench science into what I do with my patients every day. Absolutely. We need investments in the basic science, clinical, and translational research to catalyze stepwise advancements in the assessment of toxic stress and in the prevention of morbidity and mortality. Well, I'm gonna share with y'all some good news. Um, as many of you know, I left my role as the medical director of the Bayview Child Health Center in 2011 to create the Center for Youth Wellness. 
And I'm not going to take 100% credit for this, but I will say that since 2011, we have seen quadrupling in the uh, news coverage of adverse childhood experiences. And, uh, you know, I was, I was joking when I said that, but obviously this work comes from, this comes from the work of so many people, right, who are, who are shouting out the rooftops, who are calling attention to adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress as a national public health crisis. We are doing it, y'all. Um, in terms of secondary prevention, our recommendation is to screen, counsel, and refer. You don't have to have the amazing Center for Youth Wellness, I say we're amazing, at your center but what you do need to have is a thoughtful disposition. If you identify ACEs among your population, who are your trusted partners in the community that you can refer your patients to, right? And that, I think, is one of the critical parts. And once you have that, then you can really begin screening. But we also need to make sure that we are well-educated, right? So that we can counsel our patients thoughtfully. For example, we know uh, one of the things that I counsel um, my patients is that if I have an adolescent girl and she has an A score of four or more, her risk of becoming pregnant as a teenager is very, very high, right? We know that almost half in the Kaiser study went on to become pregnant as teenagers. And that affects how I, how I counsel that family, and frankly, it affects my management. We know that ACEs accumulate in childhood gradually, right? In a large national multi-site study of children exposed to or at risk for maltreatment, it was found that by age six, children had an average A score of almost two. By age 12, they had accumulated another one and a half ACEs. And by age 16, they had accumulated another ACE. The opportunity of intervention for ACEs is present at any time. And we know that if we are not screening and if we are not intervening, the process for this accumulation to continue to occur is high. So at the Center for Youth Wellness, this is what we did. We developed a, this screening tool, which is actually a de-identified screening tool. And I, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Mark Rains at John, Johns Hopkins, who uh, initially suggested the de-identified concept to us. What we did was we took the 10 traditional Felitti and Onda criteria, and we say to our patients, because let me just say, y'all, I've been screening ACEs since I read the study, since 2008. Right? And I started off just asking everybody, right? And then I ended up asking people to circle it on a form. And I will tell you, this form, oops, let me go back. This form has saved my life. What we do is we say, here are the 10 traditional ACE criteria. And we also included um, uh, between a seven to nine additional criteria, depending on whether we're screening uh, under. Uh, 12 and under or adolescents. And um, what we say is, you don't have to tell us which ACEs you've experienced, only how many, right? So if I see this number is four, I know for my patient, their relative risk of depression is 460%. Their relative risk of asthma is double, unless they're Latino, in which case the relative risk of asthma is quadruple. Uh, I know that their risk for ever attempting suicide in their life is 12 times. And I know, interestingly, based on our California data, our, our, uh, on the California survey uh, that we analyzed, for folks who had an A score or four or more, they were 11 times as likely to be a victim of sexual violence after the age of 18 than an individual with an A score of four. I know that when they're in my exam room 
and I can get that information, understand what my patient's risk is, be able to counsel them about their risk, and refer them on to services that are able to support them without having to get drawn into the sometimes difficult and uncontained story about what each of these items are. I know just from the number. In addition, we use the supplemental criteria, which includes foster care, experiencing harassment or bullying in school, living with a parent or guardian who died, um, being exposed, uh, being separated from the primary caregiver through deportation or migration, um, medical trauma, having a serious or life-threatening uh, medical illness, being witness to violence in the community, or uh, being treated badly because of race, sexual orientation, place of birth, disability, or religion. And the reason that we separated those criteria is because we cannot compare them to these national data sets around relative risk of disease. So we do that analysis separately, but we do know that these are also risk factors for toxic stress. We, uh, when a patient endorses any of those things, we ask about symptoms. And those include uh, sleep disturbance, weight gain or loss, enuresis, oncopresis, developmental regression, school failure, failure to thrive, poor control of chronic disease. Actually, that is a really big one. Um, you know, high risk behavior in adolescence, all of this stuff, it's available on our website, so I won't go through it. Um, but we ask about symptoms, and our protocol works that if a person has an ACE score of zero to three without symptoms, we do anticipatory guidance. Part of the reason we do that is because Without symptoms, sometimes it's just really hard to get families to enroll in any type of um, uh, treatment follow through. But if a patient has one to three ACEs uh, with symptoms or four or more regardless of symptoms, we believe that the fact that they're demonstrating symptoms demonstrates that they are experiencing the physiological effects of adversity. Right? And so we counsel and refer. And um, I, I, I include some sample scripts about, you know, what the heck do you say to patients, right? One of the things that we say is we now understand that exposure to stressful or traumatic experiences, like the ones that we listed, may increase the amount of stress hormones that a child's body makes. And this can increase their risk for health and developmental problems like asthma and learning difficulties. Based on what your child has experienced, I'm concerned this may be contributing to their problems in school or their worsening asthma or their weight gain, and I'd like to refer you to a colleague who can help. We also talk about some things that make a difference, include, including good nutrition, healthy sleep, regular exercise, uh, mental health, um, uh, mindfulness like meditation, and healthy relationships. And one of the, part of the reason I do that is I like to catch people doing something good, right? So I say, hey, you know, we know these things make a difference. And guess what? You're already doing regular exercise and have great healthy relationships. That's wonderful. Keep doing that. And we would like to get you some additional help to do the things uh, to support you in the areas where you need support. I also mentioned that a healthy caregiver is one of the most important ingredients for healthy children. So the same applies to mom, dad, grandma, auntie, whoever is caring for the, for the child. And really we focus on taking a two generation approach. Our model includes routine screening, symptom assessment, anticipatory guidance, and risk-based clinical management. And when I say risk-based clinical management, what I mean by that is if I have an adolescent girl and she has an ACE score of four or more, she is on long-acting anti-contraception unless there's a contraindication. That is our protocol because the risk of teen pregnancy is so high. And we are now in the process of looking into another protocol that if we have a, a patient who is Latino, uh, who has an ACE score of four or more, whether to include spirometry as part of their routine assessment, we have in-clinic spirometry at our um, center because uh, they are at quadruple the re risk of asthma. And oftentimes, uh, they don't have a strong sense of what's going on um, with their body. We also have integrated primary care and behavioral health, which includes home visits, health education, biofeedback, exercise, 
nutrition, uh, mindfulness, and you'll see tracking of biological markers with an asterisk uh, next to it. That is um, um, hopefully coming down the pike, and I'll talk more, a little bit more about that in a second. Um, I talk about a social buffering of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This is an incredibly busy slide, which primary point is to say that we recognize that um, social buffering has an impact of, on oxytocin release and oxytocin distribution reception, uh, oxytocin receptor distribution and binding. It has an impact on neural priming, including the ventral uh, medial prefrontal cortex and that some of these things that feel really touchy-feely are rooted in the biology of toxic stress, and I think it's really important for us to always focus on the biology. What is the underlying mechanism, and how do we address that mechanism? Our promising practices also include, as we know, it's, I feel like exercise should not be considered a promising practice. That's pretty evidence-based. Uh, but we know that it uh, leads to regulation of the heart rate and blood pressure, regulation of the HPA axis, decreasing uh, depression and anxiety, and regulation of cerebral neurotransmitters, including dopamine and serotonin, as well as endorphin release. And finally, uh, mindfulness similarly regulates heart rate and blood pressure, has anti-inflammatory effects, regulates the HPA axis, and uh, decreases some of the mental health symptoms, including depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic symptoms. Um, and there have been a number of great studies about mindfulness and the impact on uh, inflammation. And finally, this great study showed uh, uh, this is a study looking at intimal medial thickening, the thickness of the coronary arteries. And in this study, after a three-month meditation, um, no, I'm sorry, this is meditation and blood pressure. After a three-month meditation, they saw a 10 millimeter of mercury decrease in systolic blood pressure and a 5 millimeter of mercury uh, decrease in diastolic blood pressure. This is a slide on intimal medial thickening, where what they found was... Um, uh, with meditation, they saw a, a decrease in the thickening of the coronary arteries versus health education alone, where they saw progressive thickening of the coronary arteries. So again, uh, just really important to be evidence-based and uh, use, using the science of toxic stress in designing our interventions. What's necessary in terms of next steps? At our center, we are part of the Bay Area Regional Consortium on Toxic Stress and Health. Thank you to a foundational gift from the Tara Health Foundation. We have been able to uh, form a partnership with UCSF and UCF Be Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland. And um, a couple of the things that are happening, we are validating the ACE screening tool, which I showed you earlier. So we are doing a random three-year randomized control trial to validate that tool as well as identify correlations between ACE score and biomarkers. And we are looking at measures in the blood and saliva uh, of inflammatory markers, hormonal markers, circulatory markers, et cetera, um, to really look at whether ACE scores correlate with um, markers, uh, biological markers of disease, and whether or not I intervention improves not only clinical symptomatology, but the biological markers of adversity as well. So we are very excited about that project and hopefully we'll have uh, data to share with you in a few years. I believe that we are on the front lines of addressing this public health crisis of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. And if you, any of you would like to join us in this movement, if you go to the Center for Youth Wellness website, you will actually, what will pop up on the screen is uh, something that says stay informed. If you put your information in and click on the box that says I am a healthcare practitioner, we will automatically send you our ACE screening tools and our user guide. And we welcome any feedback that you have uh, for us. We are trying to develop a community of 1,000 pioneering practitioners to begin screening for ACEs in their clinical practices. I'm just gonna end uh, with a 
with a story that I heard from uh, Dr. Satyarthi on Monday. He talked about a uh, forest fire. And this was an old, uh, I guess, uh, an Indian uh, folk tale, that there was a forest fire that was burning up the forest. And all of the animals were running out of the forest. And as the lion, the king of the jungle, was running out, he saw this little hummingbird flying towards the flames. And he stopped and he said to the hummingbird, what the heck are you doing? Where, where are you going? The fire is that way. And the little hummingbird in his beak had a tiny drop of water. And he said, I'm going to do my part to put out this fire. I hope you all will join me in doing your part to put out this fire. Thank you.